Hello, and welcome to our talk, A Visual Debugger in Jupiter. My name is Afshin Darian, and I'm joined today by Johan Mabi from QuantStack and by Jeremy Taloup from QuantStack. We are going to be talking about some of the new debugging capabilities in Jupiter, and we're going to give you a short demonstration of them. So let's get started. And let's start as close to the beginning as we can. So some of you may have seen this photograph. It is a famous picture of a logbook that is available from the US Navy archives. And in it, we see an actual bug. And it's captioned, first actual case of bug being found. This is attributed to Admiral Grace Hopper. And it features a moth that actually found its way into a relay in an early computer and interrupted its operations. And the state of the art in 1947 was to pull the bug out of the physical hardware yourself. The state of the art recently in Jupiter has been slightly better, but only slightly. So here you can see a fairly typical workflow. On the left-hand side, I have a notebook that defines a complex function in the first cell. And the very first line of that function has a bug in it. And when I execute the second cell, you can see it throwing an assertion error because the first function is doing something unexpected. And on the right-hand side, you can see my attempts to figure out what's going on by throwing in a print statement and trying to figure out why a value that I expected is coming out differently. Now, this is fine for very trivial bugs, but frequently we find users need to leave Jupyter and fire up some other tool to try to sort out what's actually happening. And this is not a problem that's unique to Jupyter. All IDEs that want to give debug capabilities, all text editors that have some sort of visual debugging capability have a common set of problems. When you have multiple languages to support, how do you define the debugging behaviors that you want to support? And the community consensus in recent years has been to converge around the debug adapter protocol that was first specified, defined, and implemented by Microsoft for Visual Studio Code. And here you see just a glimpse of what that protocol looks like. What it basically is, is a definition of the messages you send to a debugging server and the responses you can expect back from it. So when we wanted to implement debugging in Jupyter, we adopted the DAP and extended it slightly. We have somewhat different use cases than a typical IDE in that we reside in a browser. So we added some functionality that allows you to refresh your page and still be in the middle of your debugging session. Uh, we also extended the DAP to support sending the actual code being debugged because our source code often is sitting inside a notebook cell and not a Python file or some other language source code. It's sitting in multiple blobs of text in your notebook. And the debug adapter protocol by default assumes that you're debugging files, so we had to make a small extension to it. Uh, additionally, we exposed a channel in the kernel called the control channel, and this allows us to interrupt the operation of a kernel, even if it's mid-flight executing code from your cells. Um, this control channel, its implementation isn't specified, but it does need to be able to answer even when the kernel is busy. And our implementation of this extended DAP uh, currently resides in the Zeus Python kernel, which is built on top of the Jupyter Zeus framework. And to talk a bit about how this implementation is different from IPy kernel, what the reasons for its development were, and some of its architecture, I'm going to hand it off to Johan. Thanks, Arian. 
Hi everyone, my name is Johan and I'm going to introduce you to the Jupiter Zeus project. Jupiter Zeus is actually an ecosystem of different Jupyter kernels like Zeus Python, Zeus Kling for the C++ language, Zeus SQLite, and of C++ backend for widget libraries such as XWidget, which is a C++ backend for the IPy li widget library, or XLeaflet, which is a C++ backend for IPy leaflets, etc., etc. All of these libraries can be found under the Jupyter Zeus organization on GitHub, and they are all based on Zeus. So what is Zeus? The idea behind Zeus is each time you want to implement a kernel, you need to re-implement the Jupyter kernel protocol, which can be really cumbersome. It would be really nice to be able to capture this implementation in a library once and for good, and then reuse it everywhere. And this is exactly what Zeus is, a modern C++ implementation of the Jupyter protocol. It allows developers to author kernels without having to deal with the protocol. Zeus has many advantages. First, it is written in C++, which is a common denominator. Most of the, C, most of the interpreters are written in C, so it is really easy to plug Zeus with these interpreters. Also, Zeus provides a lot of support for code completion, history, magics, which is you to author kernel with full features. And last but not least, Zeus implements the widget protocol. Internally, Zeus is made of four components. So the first one is a server, which is the low level communication layer. Another component is the interpreter, which is the minimum API you have to implement to author a kernel. The third component is the debugger, which is an API you need to implement if you want to support debugging in Jupyter. And the last component, which is the most important in the kernel core, it is the only one to communicate with all the other components. This clean separation makes Zeus really easy to extend. Another particularity of Zeus is it implements different concurrency models. So basically, a kernel communicates with the client through five different circuits. The first one is the heartbeat, which is responsible for telling the client that the kernel is still alive. Another one is the IOPUB, which is meant for publishing the results. So many clients can connect to a kernel and observe what's happening inside it. Then we have the shell socket, which is used to send different requests, such as execute request to execute some code, for instance, or complete request for having auto-completion and many other requests. The control socket is similar to the shell, but with higher priority, meaning that messages sent on the control will be processed before those sent on the shell. This behavior has been recently changed for the debugger, so we will get back to that later. And the last socket is the SDIN, which is used by the kernel to ask client for input. Xeus implements different concurrency models, but the one we are interested in in this talk is the one used by the debugger. So in this model, the control socket and the shell socket are pulled by different threads. This allows the kernel to stop the execution flow on the shell channel because you hit a breakpoint, for instance, and to be able to process messages on the control channel. So, for instance, you want to resume the execution or step into a function or many other things. Now, let's talk about Zeus Python. So Zeus Python is an alternative Jupyter kernel for Python written in C++. It is based on Zeus, obviously, on the Python interpreter and on PyBy11. PyBy11 is a C++ library which allows you to export C++ types of Python and the opposite. It also allows you to embed the interpreter into a library and to it from C++ code. So why would we need a new Jupyter kernel while we already have IPy kernel? The issue with IPy kernel is that it runs an event loop on a single thread, which makes it impossible to stop the execution flow on the shell channel while you want to be able to process messages on the control channel. The concurrency model of Zeus allows that. The debugger in Zeus Python is implemented based on PTVSD. So the idea is when the client asks the kernel to start the debugger. The custom implementation of the debugger inside Zeus Python sends some messages to the interpreter and it asks it to load some Python code that will spawn a new process. That is the PTVSD server. And then the debugger connects to the server to forward all the messages from the debug adapter protocol. And then the PTVSD server will drive the interpreter. 
So how do you get Xus Python? It's as simple as typing a single command line. So you simply run member install Xus Python dash C conda forge and you get everything on your lab. I will now leave it to Jeremy to show you a live demo. Thank you, Johan, and uh, hello everyone. My name is Jeremy and I am going to do a little demo of the debugger. So we now have this uh, debugger sidebar on the right side in uh, Jupyter Lab. We are uh, currently running uh, JupyterLab beta uh, for the 3.0 release. So it means that the debugger is going to be available in the final uh, 3.0 release. So let's uh, create a new notebook using the Xus Python kernel. And we see that we have a little button here that we can use to enable and disable the debugger. So let's uh, write a little bit of code. Uh, let's see something simple like this. Uh, all right, so we can execute the cell using control enter, but also using shift enter or using this uh, button here. Okay, so that is like a normal workflow. Uh, okay, let's put this here. But uh, what we can do now with the debugger is to enable it first, and then we get access to this part of the cell. So we can add a breakpoint, add multiple breakpoints, and we can also remove them. So let's keep one on line three, and let's execute the cell. So now we see that uh, Sivar is showing us uh, a couple more information. And in the first panel, we have the uh, variable explorer. So we have here a variable called i equals to one, which makes sense. And we have uh, also the possibility to switch into a, a table view uh, and we get information about the type of the variable. So next we have the call stack and we can do a couple of things such as continuing, uh, stop, um, stepping over, in and out of the code. Then we have uh, the list of breakpoints uh, that we saw just before. And finally, a, a little um, code editor that is uh, showing us the source being debugged at the moment. We will see a later like a use case where this is uh, particularly useful. So what can we do uh, from here? So we can go to the core stack panel and click on next to jump to the next instruction. And we see that now the highlight has moved to the line four. And uh, now we're able to see uh, J uh, and the value uh, that correspond to this variable. Okay, so let's press uh, continue and we are done. So now uh, we can execute this cell and we see that we get the result that we expect and we were able to debug uh, the first cell. Okay, so that was a little introduction just to uh, get an idea of what we can do with the debugger. So now let's look at a, another example. So this one defines a, uh, two cells. So a function here called add and here we use that function. So we're going to execute those two cells uh, normally but uh, now we're going to also use the debugger. So let's enable it and put the breakpoint uh, at this location. So this is corresponding to the line two of the first cell, but now we can execute the second cell and we see that uh, we break in the first cell and we are able to uh, have a look at the variables uh, local to the add function. But we are also able to jump back uh, to another uh, another frame of the code stack, and here we see a different uh, variables, and uh, do this uh, just to see uh, yeah the difference. Uh, and then when we are in uh, the add function, we can, if we want, uh, we could also use this little editor to add a new breakpoint, and we even we can even edit them from here or from here. Uh, they would be synchronized. And then we can just click on continue and we hit the next breakpoint. And we see that now we have the new variable that is showing up here, uh, but not uh, in the scope here. Okay, so let's click on next. And now we are back in the second cell. Uh, and then uh, next again, and then we can press continue. Okay, so that was uh, another kind of workflow uh, for the debugger where the code is split into different cells. Uh, but another thing that is often happening when working with notebooks is that we kind of lose uh, the code that we previously defined. So, and that can happen if we, for example, delete the cell. Uh, the thing is, type add and still have access to it. So the kernel still uh, remember the add function. So it means that we can still 
if we want, uh, put a breakpoint here, execute the cell, and now instead of stepping over, we're going to step in, and we see that we are okay. We are not showing anything here, but this is because now we have entered the add function, and it is shown right here. So this is where this uh, little panel is useful. It's because we are able to see code that doesn't exist anymore in the notebook, but it's still there. So we can open it in the main area. And we, if we want, we can even add new breakpoints to it. And now we're able to debug it again. So that was code that was previously executed. So we can stay on this view. I can go back to the notebook by clicking on the other frame uh, or back again to this function. And then hit continue. Can you remove the breakpoint here uh, if we don't need it anymore? Then press next. Uh, we are back back to the notebook, and uh, yeah, continue, and that is it. So uh, this is like a way to debug cells that have been uh, removed, um, but the kernel still knows about it, so it is still possible to kind of access them. Okay, so let's uh, switch to the next. Uh, example. So here we saw that uh, we had our add function defined in a notebook, but often with notebooks, uh, it's a common practice to first prototype something there and then extract uh, some logic into a module. So here we have a module uh, that is just exporting this function. So we can use it from the notebook here and we can call it. But that means that we can also enable the debugger put a breakpoint here, or actually here, it doesn't really matter for this um, example. So uh, now let's execute the cell. And we see that uh, we are uh, stopping here. But what we can do is uh, step in the code. And now it's the same as before. So we are not seeing anything uh, in the notebook. But we see that we are now uh, in this file. So we can open it here. And we can also add breakpoints if we want. And now uh, the, the path uh, is referred to uh, as the local path on the machine. So the same as before, we can switch between frames and uh, hit continue to hit the next breakpoint. Or uh, hit next to go back to the notebook and continue debugging. So yeah, so that was mostly an example to show that the debugger is also compatible uh, with this kind of workflows. OK, so another another fun thing is that, for example, uh, let's open the first uh, notebook that we, we tried. Uh, with the debugger, it is also possible to debug multiple notebooks at the same time. So we have now two debug sessions. And the debugger sidebar is updating itself when we switch between one notebook and the other. And we can step here, for example, and come back here. And then let's say, yeah, put a breakpoint, remove a breakpoint here, continue, and then come back here. So we can do this, continue, and then come back here and continue. And we have the possibility to uh, really like to have these uh, yeah, multiple notebooks uh, being debugged at the same time. Um, yeah, and another interesting use case is that uh, let's say we have, uh, OK, let's remove this one, but put it here instead. Let's say we have um, a notebook we are currently debugging, but for some reason we closed the notebook or we had to, uh, to open something else and we wanted to get it out of the way. Uh, so then we can just reopen it and the debugger is able to pick up uh, the previous state and then we can continue debugging, and the results are what we expect. But it is also possible to, let's say, we are closing the tab or even just reloading the page. So when we, the page is reloaded, uh, the notebook is reopened, and we are able to also to pick up uh, the previous state and continue debugging. OK, so uh, one more thing, um, a little bit more advanced, so let's open this notebook here. And that is uh, when we want to debug Jupyter widgets callbacks. So here is a um, BQ plot uh, figure. And here is a function that updates the, the, the data. And here is some um, uh, 
uh, callbacks that is going to be triggered whenever this slider is changed. So here we are only for now printing something and it's not showing up here in the, in the notebook, but instead it is redirected to the JupyterLab log console. So we are able to see uh, the content of this change object in the log console. So that's fine. Uh, it does the job, but sometimes we would like to in, like uh, inspect a little bit more in the details, uh, the, the content of this and to be able to know what kind of value we can use from this. So uh, with the debugger, or actually we can leave it as a, like this and put a comment, uh, a breakpoint, and then change the value of the slider. And we see that the debugger um, hits the breakpoint uh, here. And now in the variables explorer, we are able to look at the values we are interested in. So we see that uh, in our case, we want to use the new from the, the change uh, object, but we can also uh, switch back to table view, double click here, and we open this uh, change variable uh, in a new panel. So it's a bit easier to see also the type of each of the fields and uh, yeah, have a, a easier way to inspect it. So now that we know uh, the, um, the kind of uh, attribute we want to look up, so we can update the code and use new, and we can remove this, press continue, and uh, we're going to re-execute the cell. Now I'm moving the slider, and it's updating the uh, figure. Okay, so that is it. Uh, I hope you liked it. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeremy. Before we finish our talk, let's discuss the feature a little bit. One question that often comes up is, what about other kernels? And to that, we have two answers. The first is that our extensions to the DAP and our... Uh, Thanks, Jeremy. Before we close out our talk, let's discuss the feature a little bit. Uh, one question that comes up frequently is, what about other kernels? And to that, we have two answers. The first is that the DAP specification and our extensions to it are well-defined, and we encourage all kernel authors to begin supporting debugging in their kernels and to be confident that once they support debugging in their kernels, the JupyterLab front-end extension will automatically work and will automatically detect that their kernel is debuggable and the UI will appear for any notebook or console that uses their kernel. The second answer is we ourselves at Jupyter plan to support debugging for any kernels that we maintain, which includes IPy kernel. So be on the lookout for that in the near future. The other question that arises is, what new features are you working on? What's on the roadmap? And in no particular order, uh, the things that we currently are prioritizing are support for rich mind type data structures, like a pandas data frame that supports pagination and shows up in a spreadsheet view would be something that takes advantage of JupyterLab's visual architecture. Uh, support for conditional breakpoints, which many other IDEs already support. And uh, iterating on the feedback we get from users to improve the debugging experience. And better integration with Voila dashboards. And with that, I just want to thank all the people who have worked hard on this. But in particular, I would like to thank the implementers of Zeus, Zeus Python, and the debugger front end. Uh, Jeremy, Martin, Boris, uh, Johan, Sylvan. And I especially want to thank the corporate entities who have been sponsoring this work. My employer, Two Sigma, uh, Bloomberg, and Quantstack. Thank you so much for your support.